Okay, I'm, I'm happy to open uh, this session. Uh, it will be led by Anna Echeverria, who is a PhD in history at the University of Edinburgh and associate professor of medieval history at the Universidad Nacional de Educación a Distancia in Spain, in Madrid. She has published on the relations between Christianity and Islam in the Iberian Peninsula, including her books, The Fortress of Faith, the attitude towards Muslims in the 15th century Spain, and also Knights on the Frontier, and she has just published a new book, The City of the Three Mosques, Avila and its Muslims in the Middle Ages. This monograph explores the processes of adoption and resistance in which Muslims engage in order to maintain the balance in the face of the ever-changing dynamics of muslim christian relations within the wider medieval and specifically Iberian world. And she is also the uh, PI, the primary investigator of the project Mudejaves and Moriscos in Castile, 12th to 16th century. And our two uh, respondents, the first one will be Harvey. Uh, okay, uh, Chaim, Harvey, Reims uh, is the current chair of the history department uh, ben Gurion University, and the director of the Center of the Study of Conversion and Interreligious Encounters. Among his many, many publications, The Art of Conversion, Christianity in Kabbalah in the 13th Century, like Angels on Jacob's Ladder, Abraham Abulafia, The Franciscans, and Joachimism, and Hamlacha HaKetzara, Ramon Luz Ars Brevis in Hebrew. Second respondent is uh, Uri Shachar, who is an assistant professor of history at Ben Gurion University, uh, and also a member of the center here, uh, our center. Uh, he received an MA from John Hopkins University and PhD from the University of Chicago. <coughs> and during the years uh, 2012 to 2013, he was a fellow at the Cut Center for Advanced Studies in the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Urishaha studies ways in which religious communities in medieval Europe and the Mediterranean, Mediterranean negotiated their competing yet complementing no uh, notions of pious belligerence and sacred space. And his latest forthcoming publication is entitled Flavors of Intelligent Entanglement, Pollution and Purity in Jewish, Christian, and Muslim Conquest Rhetoric from the Crusading Near East. Anna, please. <coughs> I will be standing for a moment because I want to present some texts that are not in the so yes, please. So then I will sit down and we can continue. But first of all, I wanted to thank, it's better for you because I speak louder. <laughs> I want to thank the organizers of this very fine conference, Ram Petty and Haim, whom I know was behind my invitation. Uh, and it's been a wonderful time with all these wonderful subjects that we've been discussing. Uh, first of all, I would like to say a few words about our sources for the conversion of Muslims in 15th century Iberia, and a few details I think you should bear in mind for the discussion of the records I have selected. It may sound like a generalization, but unlike Jews, Muslims in Iberia did not write much about their conversion. Therefore, there are no individual narratives of change of faith that we know for the moment, I always say for the moment, uh, except Abdala uh, al um, This results in very little information on personal motives and histories, which hinders our understanding of the problem before mass conversions. And mass conversions, I refer to state forced conversions as opposed to pogrom conversions, which are different dynamics. Debates uh, were theoretically not permitted to Muslims, but took place in controlled environments. And here I'm thinking of the match list that Uri Simonson was mentioning the other day. Uh, what we don't have, we des decidedly don't have, is public disputations of faith with Muslims in Christian Iberia. This has, as you well know, an enormous importance in the process of conversion, and the lack thereof makes an enormous difference between Muslims and Jews in their relations with Christians. Another thing I want you to consider is that after Alfonso X's partidas in the 13th century, there is a legal trend that mingles royal law about Jews and Muslims. 
instead of providing a different legal framework for each community, laws about use are automatically extended to Muslims. And yet, the attitude towards the two religions are different. The combination of these two factors has to be taken into account to assess different actions of the authorities, actions and reactions of the authority concerning religious practice for each of the communities. Uh, this mingling of the laws reflects in the ordinances issued in Castile in January 1412 related to Ferrer's preaching at the royal court, uh, recollected later by Espina in his Fortalicio today. Whereas in the beginning, all the articles mention uh, the Jews and Jewesses, the Muslims and female Muslims. <coughs> but when it comes to practice, we see that there's a different enforcement of laws for Jews and Jewesses, Muslims and female Muslims. So we have to think that despite a legal assimilation, it's not quite the same. Finally, I deliberate, deliberately chose not to use polemical sources because I wanted to provide another focus of discussion. This comes a bit like we had with folk tales from everyday life and non-learned circles of society. So practical issues of conversion become more important than the religious discourse developed around them. Secondly, I would like to explain why I call this paper the institutionalization of conversion in the American kingdoms. In all these years working with issues of conversion, I have observed a gradual a change and a number of trends which I think may speak for this time. First, a gradual regulation of the places where baptisms should take place. Not just the parishes around the public markets, usual in critical situations of forced conversions, or places where disputations take place. We don't have that for Muslims, so it's not, uh, it's not valid for me. Uh, in the 15th century, royal chapels were granted permission to baptize converts related to the royal family. Local parishes were the place for the rest of the population, but public display in cathedrals was also preferred. Another issue is that by the mid-15th century, the church becomes entitled to rule conversions between the two religious minorities. This is a new trend, because before conversions among the religions, the, the minorities, would be ruled by themselves, by their laws. The, the Christian uh, authorities could not get into those because it was not their field. But in the mid-15th century, we have the first case, a Muslim woman who is converted to Judaism in the city of Calavera de la Reina. And Alonso de Madrigal in Tostado issues an opinion that is taken by the Archbishop of Toledo, where he says clearly that the church has the mission to uh, take care of these people and to supervise that there are no such conversions. And what he's talking about is the religion, the natural religion of the person, the religion in which that person is born. So this has to be preserved by the church. And in that respect, the, the Christians are able to judge over Jews and Muslims. More, the requirements for a true conversion become standardized. They are reflected in the certificates of conversion that we are going to discuss immediately. And massive unwanted conversions uh, that pose the post baptism doctrinal threats are carefully avoided. So they really have um, a lot of interest in assuring catechization and um, true conversion. The fact that a legal record signed by a priest and a notary becomes necessary to abode for baptism following a real conversion speaks for an implication of political and ecclesiastical authorities in the process. And finally, but not least, among the elite Muslim converts uh, and Jews, as we, as we have seen, gifts, salary and dress become standardized as well as proof of conversion. Patronage from high status individuals becomes customary. So with all this in mind, we will see a number of records which are not in your handout, but which I think demonstrate this way towards institutionalization of conversion. The first one you have here 
I'm sorry, but I didn't have time to deal with the Latin last time. So I am just marked the part that I'm interested in. Uh, in 1415, Pope or anti-Pope Benedict, Benedict XIII issued a bull for Fernando I of Aragon, followed by a similar one for his sons, Alfonso and Juan, establishing that they could baptize in their chapels without any further permission from any ecclesiastical authority. And this authorization involved not only their sons and daughters, which is fine, family matters, but also infidels of any gender, Jews, Muslims, or Agarins, who wished to convert to the Catholic faith. This authorization has to be seen in a context, obviously. Uh, the context we have discussed before of the mass conversions that follow the preaching of uh, Vincent Ferrer in Castile, Aragon, Provence, but also the policies of the Aragonese crown. Um, at this time, this precise time, what, why do we find peace in the chapel of the king but also of the princess? Because uh, policies in the kingdom of uh, Sicily and Sardinia made um, a need that John uh, went there as, his, uh, as lieutenant general of his father between 1415 and 16. And probably this record was issued precisely to establish the prince's chaplaincy, separate from that of his father, now that he was 17 and had his first official position in the Aragonese court, but also overseas. So this expands the range of possibility of conversions in the royal chapel from Aragon to Sicily and Sardinia. I don't want to, um, to talk very long about each document because then we don't have time. So I'll move to the next one. The Royal Sanction of Conversion to Gifts and Salaries. We spoke a little bit about that um, on, tu on Tuesday. So the second piece I wanted to examine today is a few examples of the accounts of the kings of Castile between 1410 and 1463, which I studied in the book Knights on the Frontier. In this case, conversion takes place on the frontier of Granada, and the knights who change faiths from Muslim to Christian make their way to the king's administrative offices where their salaries given in exchange for their conversion, they don't say this all the time, but in some cases we have it, given in exchange for their conversion. Uh, they may involve gifts, horses, armor, textiles, plus a salary. So here you can find one of them. Uh, normally, we find the same scheme. Uh, these are royal accounts, so we have, it has to be really short. But there are always is an introduction saying uh, who granted uh, the salary, uh, what were the cir general circumstances of the conversion of this person, uh, and then they give him 12 maravillis a day, the, the coin of that moment, uh, the measures of I, uh, Ibris, uh, they call it in the Spanish records, it's a textile which comes from the Ibo, obviously, uh, one of the main tenets of Spanish commerce with the low countries. And, uh, and oh, but obviously, like here we are not speaking, as in other records, of Granada silk. It's a very Christian cloth. I mean, cloth from Ibo is definitely woolen, uh, soft, it's something completely different. So that the, the message behind that cloth is very, very relevant. So, yeah, and the salary, let's say it's a, an average salary for a military commander or soldier in cavalry at the time. So it's not more or less, but no less than having the salary. So here you have like a whole record. It, it would look like this. Okay, so this is Fernando de Tarifa who was an Elche, that means he was a bodyguard for the king of Granada. And he came from the kingdom of Granada in some campaign, in some campaign uh, to be reconciled because the guards of the king of Granada were Christians. Uh, sorry, Christians who had converted to Islam, so then he had to return to Christianity again. And again, uh, he grants him all the nice things. What is funny is that these people are granted Christian uh, clothes, but then when when they go on a procession with the king, they are dressing as Muslim. 
So they play very much in this confusion of, I mean, some people tell me they call them Moorish God, but are they Muslims? No, most of them are Christians, but they are Christian converts, but then when they go out with the king, they are Muslims, and they should be regarded as Muslims. So they, they ride um, hineta, they, they have uh, Muslim pieces of armor, um, so they are all the time playing with confusion. So here we see uh, another case in which, uh, like payments, some of these people, when Henry IV dies and Isabella and Ferdinand come to the throne, they become just captain of royal troops or cavalry men in the royal troops. But they don't. They keep their salaries, but they don't. They are not referred to as members of any special body or anything. They just become assimilated in the general army. So going to the conversion certificates, uh, the story of these certificates stems directly from the related question of the manumission licenses issued by the slaves' owners at the time of their gaining freedom. This is a common place since Roman times, which expanded to a written proof of conversion because of the obvious links of both issues in the legal framework of both Eastern and Western policies with multi-religious populations. The first mention of the conversion of slaves appeared in canon law in the well-known text of Gregory the First Registrum, <coughs> later enlarged in Gratian's Decretum. This canon is the third of several dealing with Jews holding authority over Christians, whether as slave owners or office holders, within a distinction that discusses slaves and servants generally. It is an extract from a letter of Gregory to the Bishop of Naples. And here again we see Naples, Holy Land, Spain all getting together and differentiated at the same time. Um, now here, uh, well, no, uh, the, the letter uh, that Gregory wrote first to Naples is not quite exactly like this. In, in the Naples letter, he's making um, observations to general canon law. And he, uh, he makes exceptions depending on whether the convert needs to be sold again or not, and how, and how many months have to pass from conversion to selling or not, and things of this range. Um, the bulbs from the Pope keep being repeated. I don't want to throw on you all of them because they are a lot. Uh, they, he wrote to Jerusalem and Cyprus. Uh, the, the bulbs get uh, repeated and repeated, so we know they didn't really have an effect. But what I found very interesting is that when the Pope thinks of sending a letter to the Bishop of Majorca, the main issue, which is should we free the slave or not after conversion, changes. For Majorca, the Pope takes a very practical stance and he solves the situation, uh, which he doesn't in Jerusalem, uh, saying that in order for the bishops or the orders or whoever Christian owner they had, uh, for them not to lose property and um, like, uh, economic services and so so, the slaves will not be made free. So it's completely different from the other letters. And here you can find Saracen slaves, they will receive the sacrament of baptism, but clearly they will not be uh, man-made. Both the Cantigas of Santa Maria and the Miracles of the Virgin of Guadalupe elaborate on this subject, and they have been recently studied, uh, for instance, among others, by Amy Renner Schneider in, in her book La Conquistadora. Uh, but I want to move to another source, which I see also as a precedent for these certificates. Uh, from the uh, Libro de Sassis, here you find uh, a piece which establishes the way in which slaves should be manumitted. And there are three possibilities which are exactly the same we find when dealing with converts. The first one 
is if the Lord or Lady says before two or three witnesses, I give you freedom, I give you freedom for God's sake, and I want you to be free immediately. Here we find the witnesses already, and that, uh, the, the will of my meeting. The second, if they grant him a charter of freedom. And the third, he can, he, the, the Lord, can grant freedom upon his death or in his will. Now the problem here is when does conversion happen? It doesn't say here, but in many cases, all these happens in a context of conversion. So here, it's not clear if freedom was a condition for converting. That is, a slave had to convert in order to be free, but a converted slave was not necessarily free, or if conversion was simply a result of freedom. A slave was automatically free after conversion. Sometimes the wills, we know, they say, I will free so and so upon his or her conversion. So sometimes it's clear, but many times it's not. Um, Then we have a lot, again, of different cases. And again, the sources start making all kinds of nuances, uh, whether the slave has run away or not, and the lady or the lord is sanctioning or not, and all kinds of, of things. What is interesting here, for instance, is that normally uh, the assizes of uh, Jerusalem or any place in the Holy Land, they don't say whether the slave has um, a precise uh, faith or creed. But here you find one where it states that they can be Christian, probably from other denomination, Jew, Samaritan, Syrian, or Saracen. So here we find one where we kind of where they classify all the kinds of different slaves that can be manipulated. If uh, and and the problem here of going to Muslim land and back and converting. So I think this is also a very interesting piece because we are finding the circulation of slaves that come and go and decide to convert at some point, which is one of the very, uh, of the things that repeat all the times in all the sources in all the countries. So, the last piece I wanted to bring forth I don't have it written, but believe me, in the 14th century, it seems that the question of the written proof of manumission had, had become an important part of the civil law. The Cyprus Assize, uh, issued by King Hugh IV on 16 May 1355, it might be a reissue of another Assize, but this one um, <coughs> establishes, uh, when talking about villains, who are running around and committing crimes and so on, uh, we have to take into account that slavery in Cyprus was not as widespread as in other places, but still, uh, these fugitive villains, that is serfs who were tied to the land of their lord, but also serfs who were not tied to the land, um, they had to carry sealed letters to prove that they were free and that they could not be arrested as fugitive villains. So, and those who swear that they are transformates or free slaves should carry sealed letters from the viscount or from the bailli of the country where they live, proving that they are free men and that they cannot be arrested. So the letters are the proof for everything. So now I want to go to our text. After this running around. We go back to Castile, pre Granada War, 1479. And at this time, there are several types of Muslims who sought conversion to Christianity in the kingdom. There are a few Mudejars who did so from personal conviction. There are some adventurers, mercenaries, captives, men of fortune who lived in, on the frontier and this was usually changed several times in their lives, and we have really funny stories about what they did and how they did it. Uh, there are also renegades, uh, people who were um, converted to Islam when the frontier went in one direction and then converted 
back to Christianity when the frontier went in the other direction, people like this, while they were explaining their motives. Um, so these are the, the closest we can get to conversion stories, really. Otherwise, there's nothing. Uh, but also, as we have seen, uh, conversions on the frontier became very common in the 1950s, uh, 15, 16, so on, uh, during the campaigns. And it's, it's funny to see, uh, both in the chronicles and in the records, that while the king was fighting here or there, there were these and that people who came, and they came to see the king because they wanted to convert, and they passed over to our religion, and they were very nice, and they did us a big service because they showed us the door to, en to the entrance of the castle of so-and-so, and then we went, we conquered the castle, oh, they were received as Christians, great. So we have peace all over. It may be a commonplace, a literary figure, but I think it also uh, shows at least the unease of a lot of um, Muslim troops who were seeing that Granada was maybe not lost, but not going well, <coughs> certainly. And they wanted to be on the winner's side. Um, there's also the struggle among branches of the Nasrid dynasty, which means that people who were in the wrong part of the government, let's say, would run over to Christians quickly before things got worse. So we have all these people running around. These people normally are high class, uh, Muslims, and as we have seen in all these other records, they come directly to the king's household. They're, that's not a problem. I mean, the problem is for a common citizen to change religion and then have to move in normal uh, environments. Uh, the, the, the high standard ones don't have a problem. So the captives, and here we come to this, uh, to this record, to become freedmen, these people have a problem. They will not be recognizable automatically by the nice robes that the kings are giving. Uh, my mission uh, becomes completely standard, standardized as well, and we find a lot of testaments or the cartas de aloria, the my mission licenses. Uh, so I think, I think this is all to do also with the reorganization of the king's administration. So everything has to be stated on paper, which wasn't the case before. So we, we are dealing also with changes in, in government and, and the way uh, things are done in the kingdom, both in Castilla and the uh, So uh, what these certificates uh, are there for is to secure the circulation of these free converts without being captured again. Normally, what we find in the sources is whether uh, a slave has been taken during war or during peace. But here we are in a strange situation because they are preparing the war against Granada. They are not yet um, in war. It's 1480s. So they have just issued uh, the law of the Cortes of Toledo in 1480 where both minorities have to go to ghettos. Uh, both Jewish uh, and Muslims should be in fuderias and morerias, and this is the first general enforcement of ghettoization in, in Castile, in Castile, not in Aragon. So really, in this time, we find people being circled, and they call it like that, enfercamiento, I think it's the word. So they get circled in walled um, neighborhoods. In 1412, they hadn't achieved that. I mean, even the canons of the cathedrals were complaining because these people were living in their houses, so they don't want them circled somewhere. They want them out in their houses, paying the rent. So, but here, it's the first, first time. So they've got that in 1480. They had one or two years to get into the neighborhoods. And the second thing is, how do you grant converts the, the, you know, the safe conduct to move around without being labeled as Jews or, or Muslims. That's it. So this is the response, these letters. So I was asked to read the letters very quickly. I think I still have time. Um, so here again we see the standard the standardization of uh, the record and what it says. 
it varies slightly from one to the other because the circumstances are different, and we will see it in a minute. But the first thing they state is where. The main difference I see between these two records is one takes place in Toledo, right in the center of the kingdom, and the other is in Alcalá la Real, which is a massive fortress in the frontier of Granada. So here we have a difference, because one will be like a very settled converso, and the other will be a converso who can move around and is a renegade, actually. So the situation changes. First of all, the city, where the record, the conversion takes place. Uh, the first one, certificate to prove that Juan de Castilla is a Christian, let it be known by all and each of those who see this scripture that in the most noble city of Toledo, Juan de Castilla, knowing about the error of Mohammedan evilness, inspired by the great gift and grace of the Holy Spirit, blah, 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 he converted. Okay, second thing, and this is very important now, catechization. He contemplated for some days as a catechumen and asked to be instructed in the faith of Jesus Christ. And due to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he came to know the error in which he had been living under, until then, and asking for baptism in this said city, blah, 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 more religious things, the said Juan waited with all firmness to be saved and reach the atonement of all his sins. And so he asked for the said baptism in this city, as has been said. So here we have, he's been thinking, he's been catechized, he asks for it willingly, which needs, I mean, in all the treatises they say, Will is necessary. You don't get to a new faith through compulsion, through conversion. So this is all, like all they need to state. Willing. And of course, with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So we've got everything. Really, really a convert. Next, who is going to baptize this convert? In this case, it was a certain Alfonso Lopez, clergyman, priest of St. Ines one of the churches in the city. Then who speaks for him? Here comes the figure of the patron or the person who introduces the new convert. Normally, if it's a slave, it's his former owner. Uh, but in the case of free people, uh, it's normally someone of some standing. In, in the conversions that take place at court, it's normally a marquis, a duke, an archbishop, whoever. It's a, it's a very powerful patron. So we have to assume that this person is going to be in the retinue or around the household or, or in some way related to that person. In this case, this is Lord Gomez Manrique, <coughs> corregidor, judge, and major judge of the city, and member of the King Our Lord's Council. Okay, And the, the convert has the name of one, which is not exactly the king's name, but the prince's name. <coughs> it's okay. So, again, a next step is questioning about his belief. Now we go into the ceremony. He's been introduced by somebody, and now in the second paragraph, almost in the middle, the same Juan asked again for baptism for himself. So again, he is free. And he answered to all the questions required for the sacrament. He was asked by the mentioned priest. But here there's a funny nuance, together with the said Lord Gomez Manrique. So probably the Lord kind of helped, you know, to answer the things he was not very ready to answer, blah, blah, blah. And so with all devotion, um, so, 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 he becomes that. This is Gomez Manrique. Uh, it's the that uncle that of Jorge Manrique, the brother of Rodrigo. That's, that's what people the, think. The playwright, the poet. That, that, that. <laughs> yeah. He was very anti Jewish. He was very anti Jewish. Yeah. yeah. But it seems that he could kind of work with Muslims. <laughs> but here is like the funny thing. Well, I won't get into that. Uh, so. Uh, the next, well, here, uh, of course, here comes the, 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 the name of the very powerful other person who is testifying to this conversion, Dr. Fernando Sanchez Calderon, 
Archdean of Mallorca, of the Council and the King and Queen, chaplain, working worker of the Holy Church of Toledo. So, I mean, all these involvement of authorities has to be stated as well. And then the witnesses. Uh, he is witnessing to that. He has received the information, so he probably wasn't there. Uh, but people, his delegates, who were probably there, have told him, and he's ready to witness to his conversion. And then uh, the next paragraph we have is uh, what would be more similar to the manumission licenses, the grant of the status, by which I tell and notify all the people of any state, preeminence or condition, who may be wherever the said one happens to be, so there's going to be a circulation, that he is a free Christian and he's not obliged to any certain and so he should be treated and be received in the divine office and administer the church sacraments so that he may know how much better he is treated for having abandoned the error in which he used to live, having chosen the Christian law that is a truthful and Catholic and without error. So here we see also a, a change of perception that if they come, they won't lose position, they won't lose their properties, they don't lose anything. We, we have to show them that they are better we are better if he treated them well. So, and then they give him the safe kind uh, for more firmness and for his safety, which is very important because if he's moving in Christian lands, uh, if they take him, they will probably put him in a ghetto. So this needs to be shown to any, and, and we know that that happens to a number of people. So this needs to be shown, it's like the passport. I ordered this letter to be given to him, signed with the with my seal and with everything like that. So here we have it. And it's complete institutionalization of a number of conditions. And complete um, how would I say, if you see the, the as they say the tenor of the document, it's absolutely standard administrative stuff from the Catholic the Catholic King's time. I mean, it's, perfect, we could study paleography on this. It has all the required things, and one after the other. So moving to the other one, Christophorus of Chillon, he um, decides to convert, and we are going forward. Now this is 1483, so we are closer to, to uh, the war and the instances of the war. So this time it's a more, Alcalá Real is a very provincial town. It's a big fortress. A small town. Um, yeah, it was one of the places where, where the royal troops would be um, accantonados, so that knows. Um, garrison. 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 So uh, it's, a, it's a place of, of circulation as well, lots of circulation of people of any origin. And here, what we have is a very nice church, I have to say, but, but a very local church. It's not the big thing with the Archbishop of Toledo in between and all that. So we find a slightly different approach to the question. So again, we have the where in Alcalá la Real, uh, in the Church of St. Mary, the big church which was built by the Muslim fortress after the conquest. Uh, and it says, in the building of the said church, being there a great number of men and women who are neighbors and inhabitants of the said city and others. So these are, this is going to be witnessed by the whole community. This is something more popular in a way. And then who? Rui Lopez de Jaén, clergyman and priest, chaplain of the church. He is the one who is going to baptize. And then the notary public of the city, Diego Sánchez de Alcalá, who is going to take witness. So there comes uh, Christopher, Christopher of Chillon, a youth, about 23 years old. I can imagine the boy, poor. Um, and says that he was captured and he was, in this case, there's not so much of an introducer as um, a story of uh, the Christian people who were nasty to him, which is Lord Martin Fernandez, governor of the fortress of, Lo of Los Donceles, another big, big frontier castle, and his son, who is um, Diego Grande. <coughs> so now what we get into is the narrative here, yes, of conversion. Why did he choose to go back to Granada and uh, return to Islamic faith, or go to Islamic faith, or whatever you want to put it? 
um, he was a slave, he was captured, nobody paid for his rescue, but the Lord says that even if he uh, converts, which he does, he will not be free. So the guy look, obviously feels uh, aggravated and he decides to fly away at the first possibility, he does so, um, and he goes to Granada. So what is the problem there? He probably, he probably was brought up really in, in Christian lands and he doesn't find a place for himself. So he decides to come back. But what do they need to come back? They need to perform a service to the Christian community, otherwise they will not be accepted now. And I think Harvey will talk a little bit about that maybe later. Maybe. So I won't go on it, uh, on that. But he says that, like he uh, he, convert, he was turned Christian and he received the waters of baptism in the town of Chillon. And being a Christian like this, he said Master Diego Ferrandez, governor of the fortress, still had him as a slave. So for his greed and desire to be free and enfranchised, when the King our Lord went to the meadows of Granada this year, he crossed to the city of Granada and became a Muslim. Being in the same city, once he had become a Muslim, he remained for some time and then met an Elche, another guard for the Sultan, who was called Bashir. Both in concordance agreed to return to the land of Christians to reconcile with our holy Catholic faith and took a child, son of Rodrigo de Benavides, who was kept in Granada as a hostage in the hands of the Genoese, so here we have again all kinds of people around, and brought him to the said city to give him back to his father, Rodrigo de Benavides. So what they do is they trace a boy they know, whose father they know, and they rescue him, bring him back, great deal, wonderful, you can come back to Christianity, good. So then again, we find the, um, the story of the ceremony, but uh, this ceremony has to be a bit different. So uh, the mentioned Rui Lopez, once the said Christophorus was bare chest, and Rui Lopez holding a book in his hand, and the said Christophorus knelt before him, while beating him because he had converted to Islam. The said Rui Lopez asked the questions required for reconciliation, slightly different from the questions required for baptism, to which the said Christophorus answered and gave satisfaction, in such a way that the said clergyman Rui Lopez stated that he had him for reconciling in the Holy Catholic Church. And again, said conduct, the said Christophorus asked for a testimony of how all this took place for the safeguard and preservation of his rights. And he was giving the certificate, we have the witnesses, <coughs> but here we have to see again that there's nobody helping him to answer the questions. So probably he had been correctly catechized in the first conversion, and now he's just asked to come back. So, I think here is the field of the discussion now, and this was my debate. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you, Anna. Um, and I have to say that uh, um, when I agreed, when I agreed to uh, respond to, to uh, Anna, um, I didn't realize what I was letting myself in for, particularly, particularly uh, since uh, I think it was Tom who said before that he deals with wishy-washy intellectual... Uh, uh, was it wishy-washy? Was that the term you used? I think so. Okay. It's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel, I feel more or less uh, in, the same, uh, in, in the same boat, so I'm, I feel slightly out of my comfort zone. But having been mentored in this university for a long, long time by a, a wonderful, wonderful historian called Elena Lori, who... Uh, who for whom the archives were uh, a second home. And having spent many hours of conversation with her, I hope that I can somehow do this uh, a little bit of justice and add only a few things to, to, uh, to what Anna uh, already said. So, I have to say that when I read the, fir the first text, and you made, you made it very, very clear to us, that, and I very much like the, your title, The Institutionalization, it, it read to me, I, I don't, I, the, some of the people sitting around the table who were here a couple of weeks ago at the yes. seminar given by David uh, um, Wasserstein, when, when, when I read the first uh, uh, document, I thought to myself, oh, here we have an, another example, uh, which is exactly what you said, right, of a, uh, 
document which can be filled up in many many different uh, uh, ways, but is in fact but is in fact a formula, right? Where you have uh, uh, and, and according to circumstance you uh, mm -hmm. you uh, change the uh, you change the, the, the wording and you put and you put uh, um, uh, and you put what is necessary. But I, I was wondering, you said you, you mentioned in your comments, so you said that, um, if I understood you correctly, that this letter seems to reflect, or this uh, a document seems to reflect, not a, not the conversion of an elite, but a, of a of a lesser uh, um, level of, of a, a conversion. But when you look at the when you look at the document, it the document actually doesn't um, talk about isn't actually an, uh, a ref, uh, or doesn't have any evidence of the com of the aside from the fact that it talks about the baptism and everything else, but it does. It's not a document that recalls the baptism, but is a notorial document which is supposed to protect um, uh, Juan, like this Juan, from anyone asking him afterwards about whether whether he uh, uh, was a true was a true convert or not. And then, as you said, he produced. You could produce uh, uh, this document, and when you look when you look at the uh, um, language, and as you stated, it has uh, there's a lot of religious mumbo jumbo, right? In, in the sense that it gives you the uh, and seems to want to say yes, this person converted out of uh, out of true conviction. Uh, the, the lovely thing, muchas veces pulso de su corazón y anima, right? It, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is uh, sort of, um, you know, knocked on his soul, and and he's opened the door for uh, for, for the Holy Spirit, and he's, and it's not just the door. I mean, the uh, yeah, okay, the cash so, bars, the cash bars, it's quite a so even more so. Yes, it's, so the, it's the, it's the Holy really Spirit has seeped into military, has seeped military, into military. his uh, 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 in, into his heart. It's military language. Sorry, it's military language. It's I didn't think about it so much in the context of military language, but, but yes, uh, uh, but I guess in, in the sense that it made me begin to wonder as to, as to whether um, this isn't a sort of a document of convenience, rather than a document that is really meant to reflect uh, a conversion, and I wondered what he would need it for. I mean, you sort of gave the answer in, in about the 1480s, where, where people are being put into, where, where, they're, where they now have to live within certain within certain areas, but it seems to me that in Toledo he wouldn't have needed it. Right? So he might have needed it, he might have needed it outside of outside of Toledo when he was traveling around. Then the question that came to my mind is so what's he traveling for? Okay, is is again, is this part of uh, all the preparations for the what's going to happen in Granada for the for the conquest of Granada and therefore what we have here is perhaps a spy. Or someone, or someone who's uh, uh, being sent, being sent on a, a royal mission, and therefore, therefore needs this uh, uh, document. So one of my questions is, is, how many other documents like this uh, uh, do we have? Right? And I mean, I don't know, so I, so I'd like to know. And also, why, why in this document do we not hear the, the people who are involved in it seem to be quite important? Right? They're not, they're not just your run-of-the-mill uh, parish priest who's. Uh, uh, giving evidence of, of uh, and we talked about and you mentioned also the idea of giving the robes and the clothes and you talk and in your book you show how wonderful they are the, about the Moorish guards about uh, the robes that are given but so <coughs> what happens here why it seems to be a sort of uh, uh, the document seems to talk about baptism but doesn't give us the whole uh, uh, doesn't give us the whole picture and at the same time it might it might be very much it seemed to me uh, uh, something that uh, uh, is shows conviction, but really its purpose is, is something totally, totally different. And that's just a question. I'd, I'd like to leave that as a as a question, and actually turn more to the second document, which I found, which I found uh, uh, <coughs> really to be a fascinating, a fascinating document. And as you said, it, it happens all the t all the. Uh, actually, when I first read it, I thought, oh, Christopher of of uh, how do you pronounce it? Chilion, Chilion. I thought, oh, maybe we have and maybe we have done for Christopher Colon, yeah. right? And uh, uh, but then of course uh, um, that was just uh, my my uh, my first thing. But then then of course it isn't. There's nothing to do with Christopher Columbus or anything anything of that sort. And it, 
in this document, which happens in 1483, is really a frontier document, it seems to me. All the towns that are mentioned, as you said, the fortress is the a fortress in the Granada area. All the little towns that are mentioned uh, um, in the area, well, actually it's not so. The, if I go back to the document a second, so we have, um, he was a slave in, in uh, uh, Chilon, right? So Chilon is, is uh, uh, 200 kilometers south of Toledo. Right? It's in the area of, of Ciudad de uh, Real. Okay, and then Lucena and Espejo, which are the other two places which are mentioned as being towns belonging to, to the Lord, are actually much, much closer to, uh, to Granada. They're another 200 kilometers, 200 kilometers, uh, um, and 250 kilometers south of, uh, of, of Shilon, not far from Granada. And if all the events that are described in this document actually happened in 1483, as the document, as the document says, 1483 was an interesting year around Granada because it was the time when the king of Granada uh, was actually captured. Right? By, he was captured and then I think he paid a ransom and then was sent back, was uh, allowed to go back to, uh, to uh, uh, Granada. So, so there's a lot happening on the, on the frontier. And, when, and this comment about the king being in the meadow, the king our lords went to the meadows, meadows of uh, uh, Granada, hides a lot, more, a lot more behind it. In other words, there's an enormous amount of things uh, um, going on here, and particularly, and particularly in, that, uh, in that year. Of course, what was mentioned before was the Genoese, right? And this is another sort of little uh, um, thing of interest, because the Gen because if, and I might be totally wrong here, so tell me, but the Genoese were very involved in the gold trade from um, sub-Saharan Africa to uh, Europe, and, and which a lot of it came through Granada. Right, so the Genoese are there, and I don't know if that's still true in the 1480s. I know, I know it's... I know it's uh, they might uh, have some of that, but they have also a number of other things I can tell you. Okay, that, that would be... Uh, because the, the, the Genoese yeah. thing there... Uh, yeah. uh, and, and, and in fact, the hostage who they rescue, who is not just anybody, right, if, I, if I've identified him uh, uh, correct, uh, uh, correctly, he's the, uh, his name is Don Diego de Benavides. He's the, the, the fourth... He will be, he will be the fourth the fourth count of Benavides, which is a, a pretty large uh, and pretty important uh, um, um, called fiefdom, or, or yeah. well, in, from the north, right? So it's uh, so it's a, it's a pretty uh, um, important. He's, he's not just a, uh, a little boy that they managed to um, take and bring back, but he's actually. Uh, Someone of quite importance. I think if I have identified the right person, then his, then his son, also called Rodrigo de Benavides, named after his named after his grandfather, was in fact a member of the court of Philip II and went with him, and went with him to England and was uh, uh, very involved in, in in diplomacy. So this is quite this is quite a significant uh, uh, find. But I thought it would be interesting to see this letter in light of the Sieta Portides. The, which was mentioned, was sort of mentioned, which is in fact the law code of uh, that was promulgated by Alfonso the Tenth in the 13th century, but was did not actually become law until about the mid the mid 15th century, uh, the mid uh, 14th century, sorry, the mid uh, 14th century, and I thought I've photocopied here a few of the uh, papers I've passed around. This And I think, I think it sheds some interesting light on, on what happens here in this, uh, um, in this uh, letter. Okay, so, I have my own copy. Yeah, so it's in the, the Sieta Partidas are divided into seven, into seven uh, uh, books. And the, Jew, and the laws regarding Jews and, and Jews and Muslims are in the seventh, are in the seventh uh, book. As uh, Anna said, they are they are separate, but quite uh, uh, similar. They have different, uh, uh, and they're uh, um, back-ended with laws regarding heretics. Mm -hmm. okay? So you have Jews, you have Jews, Muslims, heretics. And what we have here is a part of the chapter that deals with um, Muslims. And in uh, chapter four, 
Okay, which you have, uh, which is, is, is what punishment a Christian deserves who becomes who becomes a, a Moor, which isn't which isn't the case here, because our case here is a Moor who's brought up as a uh, who's converted to Christianity as a slave, who then uh, um, goes back Lopes. to Islam and then decides to return to uh, uh, Christianity. But I think there can be a case made for the fact that he obviously was converted to Christianity as a child. He's like, so I think he's considered. So I think he's a he's considered a Christian, and the and so the, I'm not sure that the first backsliding should be really uh, uh, considered. I'm not even sure if it was done by choice. If he if he made the decision to become to become a a, a, um, a Christian, but it's interesting the reasons given why people might convert in the in this year that Okay, and it says. I just want to read a, a small part of it. Men sometimes become insane and lose their prudence and understanding, as for instance, where unfortunate persons and those who despair of everything renounce the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ and become Moors. And there are some of them who are induced to do this through the desire to live according to their customs, or on account of the loss of relatives who have been killed or died, or because they have lost their property and become poor, or because of unlawful acts which they commit, dreading the punishment which they deserve on account of them. And when they are induced to do a thing for this kind of any of the reasons aforesaid, or others similar to them, they are guilty of very great, very great wickedness and treason. For on account of no loss or affliction which may come upon them, nor for any profit, riches, good fortune, or pleasure, blah, blah, should they renounce the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which they will be saved and have ever, have ever uh, um, lasting life. Okay, now, it's, the act of conversion, according to the Sieta Partida, seems to be an act of insanity. Okay, as which in is, religion. sorry? As in other religions as, as well. Yeah, <laughs> as, but it seems to be an act, of, uh, an act of insanity, but the law is actually, actually seems to be, not, not, I won't say accepting, okay, but at least not, uh, it's definitely not accepting, right? Because if, if you see f uh, further on in the paragraph, if this person is found in to be found in the kingdom, in our dominions, he should be, he should be uh, uh, killed. Okay? But it does seem to understand that there are a number of reasons that per people might uh, uh, convert, and only one of them has to do really with conviction. Right? There are plenty of other reasons why people might uh, uh, be induced to, I mean, it's insanity, but why people might be, might, might be induced to change their uh, uh, religion. And if we go to um, chapter 6, sorry, before that, chapter 5, very briefly, okay, which deals with what penalty a Christian deserves who becomes a war, even if he subsequently repents and returns to our faith, which is very relevant, very relevant to, uh, uh, to the, our case. So the, it, so it, the Sieta Pradida says, apostata in Latin means in Castilian, a Christian who becomes a Jew or more, and afterwards repents and returns to the Christian religion. Because a man of this kind is false and manifests contempt for our faith, he should not remain unpunished, even though he repents. For which reason, the learned men of the ancients declare that such a person must remain forever infamous. And then he can't, so he can't give testimony, and he can't, and there's a certain amount of things that he can't do. And regarding inheritance, he's not allowed to. Uh, um, and he's not allowed to uh, um, uh, inherit and, and uh, uh, things like that. However, this is what this is what's uh, uh, very interesting in Law Eight, okay, which is on page, which is on the, the next page. For what reason a Christian who becomes a Jew or more and afterwards repents, returns to the faith of the Christians, can escape the penalty aforesaid? It may happen that some of those who renounce the Catholic faith and become Moors will attempt to render some great service to the Christians, resulting in the substantial benefit of the country, and for the reason that they who endeavor to perform such a service may not remain unrewarded, we consider it proper and we order that they be pardoned and released from the penalty of death which we stated in the fourth law preceding this one, shall be inflicted upon them on account of the offense in which they are guilty. Right? And uh, again, slightly further on, for a party who commits an act of this kind makes it sufficiently understood that he is attached to the Christians and would make return to the Catholic faith if he had not left it through shame 
or on account of some reproach by his relatives or friends, and therefore we order and we desire that his life be granted him even though he may remain, he may remain no more. And if after he has rendered the services to the Christians, as I foresaid, he repents of his sin and returns to the Catholic faith, we order and we consider it proper that he also be released from the penalty of being considered infamous. Okay, so again, when you look at these, when you look at these laws and then look back at our, look back at our uh, letter, right, it, it seems that we see the reflection of the Seta Partidas in the uh, actions of, of what happened and what, interest, what is of interest to me again is did he get his freedom? In other words, I think it's unclear from the, from the uh, um, document right, if he eventually does get his... Uh, uh, in other words, his service was great enough to allow him to come back to Christianity and be accepted, he goes through the... This, uh, uh, um, he goes through the... Uh, ceremony of being bare chest and beaten and, 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 saying, and saying whatever he has to, uh, to say. But the question is, does he regain his freedom? Now, that was the whole purpose of the exercise, right? He wanted to, he wanted to uh, uh, get manumission. So he goes to Granada, gets this Christian boy, together with the editor, the renegade, who also, I presume, comes back to Christianity. They return, they return to Christianity, but then what? And here, and here it seems to me that if the law of the Sieta Partidas should have been followed, right to the letter, he should have been given his manumission, but the document, but the document uh, uh, um, doesn't uh, tell us. So, without wanting to sum it up, I want to leave us with questions. I think these documents are a fascinating example of daily life, and I think they provide us with a lot of, que they provide us with a lot of questions and about <coughs> conversion, and I often, uh, uh, I like Brian Katlos, uh, uh, Brian Katlos' uh, distinction where instead of his talking about con convivencia, he talks about convenientia. Right? In other words, that, and, and I think that more convenience. Right? And I think these documents reflect in many ways the, uh, um, how daily life is much more interesting, varied, contradictory, to what we uh, uh, think of the norm when we read, when those of us who engage in intellectual history read our theological works, our uh, uh, I don't know, te texts which we uh, would like to think reflect reality, but probably, but probably uh, uh, don't. Thank you. Okay, so um, my comment uh, then is from uh, fascination, if not uh, bewilderment, bewilderment um, not from, from one document, but really from one clause, uh, which, will, which will I, I will um, look into in a minute, uh, and how it betrays the role that Knights on the Frontiers played in articulating interconnected languages of political theology and claims for sovereignty, embodying, as they did, a volatile space marked by both curiosity and uh, suspicion, and very much like uh, Harvey, I was under the very strong impression that the second document, even more than the first one, uh, behind its uh, typical use of uh, terse language and uh, kind of a matter-of-fact uh, tone, um, hides a uh, highly fascinating and complicated episode, which I was very much taken uh, by. And uh, my comment, too, revolves around um, an additional document that I'd like to introduce, but let me first uh, set up the case I'll try to uh, be making. Um, so in recent years, so recent years have seen a growing interest in the function that warriors were thought to fulfill in mobilizing and creating vectors of piety, loyalty, and political symbolism along the frontiers of Latin Christendom in the late medieval Mediterranean. And among the recent contribu contributors to uh, this discussion, where these discussions are, among others, Hussein Fancy, Michael Lower, and of course, Anna Achevaria's uh, Nights on the Frontiers. Um, a, little, a little bit earlier on, the aforementioned late Ilana Luri, uh, whose presence is very much here, uh, and uh, Jean Richard uh, with, uh, pertaining to the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, there's also Yvonne Friedman and uh, uh, Daniel Hershenson, among others, who represent an interest in a subset of uh, this question relating mm -hmm. to the role um, um, 
uh, or, or legal status and experience of prisoners or captives, often from a knightly background, but, but not only. So over the course of the 13th and 14th centuries, um, hundreds of uh, soldiers, we are told, entered the service of rulers across their political and religious divide, acting as kings' personal protectors, their diplomats, and sometimes even entertainers. Numerous Muslim knights, for example, served on the ports of Aragonese knights. In North Africa, as Michael Lower has shown recently, the papacy's support for the mercenaries was tied to its larger aspiration to re-Christianize North Africa, for which a strategy, a strategy was devised in which mercenaries featured prominently. But the widespread use of mercenaries, we are told, is thus the doing of bureaucrats with a desire to increase efficiency and reduce costs by employing cheap labor. What was at stake, rather, as Hussein Fancy tells us, are regi regimes who, through those mercenaries, were making possibly unprecedented claims for absolute sovereignty and were staging mercenaries and converts in key roles in the mechanisms that were devised to make these claims manifest. The increasingly more ambitious aspirations of rulers across the Mediterranean to divinely sanctioned authority rested on a political theology that bound together Christian crowns and Muslim soldiers, or Mus Muslim sultans with Christian soldiers. Those knights were thought and asked to physically demarcate the very space of sovereign, or excuse me, the space of the sovereign, and to form part of the language of power, not by denying or minimizing their religious difference. It is rather through their ability to, ability to create a space that transcends the terms through which sovereignty manifests itself, namely the law, that they were part of the machine that created this very sovereignty. Rulers, in, other, in their claim for absolute jurisdiction, in other words, sought to capitalize on the enduring difference of their guard as a means to make manifest these political theological ambitions. So I now go back to the document and ask myself, why was it important for the author of this second uh, record to incorporate the clause uh, in, I suppose, the, towards the end of the first uh, paragraph about the additional convert that um, joins Chris Christopher on his way back to Christianity. And the, the clause is, um, and then he, Christopher, met an Elche who was called Mechil or Bashir, okay? which on the face of it seems to add nothing to the legitimacy of Christopher's final conversion to Christianity, which is, after all, the purpose of this document. <clears throat> so to remind us of the basic facts of the, of the story, Christopher, we are told, was a Moor who was taken captive as a young, uh, at, at a young age, and later in life was converted to Christianity. Then, while on duty serving as a knight under the governor of uh, Chion, he defected to Granada and became a Muslim. And my, I'm, I'm, my understanding of he went to the meadows, I think, as, uh, as Harvey, I think, uh, <coughs> insinuated, is that it's, it's, part of, it's, uh, it's a military um, expedition, right? It's a, it's a military context in which this took place. In Granada, <coughs> this Christopher met an Elche called Bashir, and uh, both decided to return to Christianity, bringing back with them a Christian child who had been taken hostage. Bashir, who my understanding is probably was born a, a Christian born, taken captive at a young age, and, convert, and then converted to Islam. He crosses together with Christopher back to Christianity, but brings along with him both his name, so at least at the point of this, um, this, um, this snapshot of the event, the second convert doesn't uh, change his name. He's still called Bashir or Bashir. Um, and the semantic as well as symbolic <coughs> weight that is encaps encapsulated in the title, Elche. So he brings with him, that is, the Muslim perspective that is embedded in the category of Elche, which um, the history of the semantic history of which uh, Anna traces very beautifully in the book on the Knights on the Frontier, um, and which is something that um, Muslim authors might use to describe a, um, a guard that may have uh, been born Christian but converted to Islam, so there's no re reproachment necessarily in the present form of the, of the, of the guard, but entails a certain dissatisfaction with, with, with respect to at least one episode in the prehistory of, of, that, um, of that, that person. So in Arabic, ilj or iluj or uluj, and that kind of transformed into elche uh, or elche. In other words, various vectors 
pulling in more than one direction exists simultaneously in the same narrative, and perhaps that is the function that the mercenary culprit <coughs> employs, creating, that is, the, this multi-directional multi, multi literary space. It is for this reason that the rare occasion in which we can listen to both sides of such a story is particularly illuminating. And so I would like to introduce a couple of narratives from the Eastern Mediterranean, which relate an affair not, un not unlike the one in this document, but one for which we are fortunate enough to possess the two mirroring perspectives, related, related uh, by both a Frankish and an Ayyubid chronicler. It is a tale about a knight called John Gale, and it provides an example for the way authors conceived of the physical and linguistic borders which warriors occupied, seen uh, from both a Christian and a Muslim perspective. John Gale, a Frankish knight born in Tyre, we're told, fled to the Muslim territories to escape punishment for a crime he had committed. Apparently, John murdered his lord after the latter had caught him in an act of adultery with his own wife. So basically, John uh, and his boss's pretty wife. Good grudge. Excuse me. Pretty good grudge. Yeah, pretty good grudge. And so um, John and his uh, the, his boss's wife were um, had an affair, and uh, John decided to murder his own boss and then to flee. Um, so Sal Salahadin, we're told, welcomed John very warmly. He gave him much wealth and lands as well as garrisons to protect them. What is more, the Sultan asks that John train his nephew to bear arms in the fashion of the Franks, quote, so à la guise de Franc, and that he teach him, the nephew that is, um, courtliness and good conduct. One day, Saladin took both the knight and his pupil on an expedition to Aleppo. John occupied the boy with exercises in honor and good conduct, while he himself sent for a messenger from the nearby Templar castle. The knight who was looking for a way to return to his homeland, offered to turn the boy over to the Templars in return for half of the ransom they would gain from him and for their promise to protect him from the Frankish family of his previous lord. After the Templars paid him 14,000 peasants and vouched for his safety, John took the boy to the fields outside of Damascus in the pretext of bird hunting and kidnapped him to the castle of Safin. So the end of the story is that Saladin finally ransomed the boy after many years um, in, fact, in, Frank, in Frankish captivity in return for many uh, Christian prisoners and the large sum of money. Despite the fact that John crossed the lines and offered his service to the enemy, the Frankish account is wholly sympathetic towards him. He, for example, is said to have developed a reputation among his contemporaries for someone who possesses an intimate knowledge of Ayyubid court culture. But this account celebrates chivalric codes not by hiding, hi, highlighting the differences between Frank and Saracen, but rather by destabilizing their boundaries and by portraying the production of pious chivalry on the fantasy of a field of shared aristocracies. What is more, seeing as Saladin was succeeded by his nephews, the sons of his brother, his brother um, al adil rather than by his own sons, this account could be seen to cultivate a fantasy in which Christian militant codes came to form an essential part of the political langu language of Ayyubid lordship or sovereignty. Of special importance for our context, I think, is the fact that in this story, treason and chivalry are inextricably tied. The Arabic account of uh, this event reaffirms these literary trajectories <coughs> and adds important dimensions by inverting the picture. The Damascene chronicler Abu Shama, who died in 1268, doesn't dwell on the circumstances that led the Frankish knights to Damascus but mentions only that he sought asylum amid the Muslims. What is more, the author does not depict the cunning negotiations between John and the Templars. Instead, he claims that the Frank enticed the boy, whose name here is mentioned, Shahin Shah, by deception. Lying to him, he said, quote, if you come to the king of the Franks, he will grant you the rule, or the crown, al-mulk, or the sovereignty, perhaps. Significantly, in order to make this false promise credible, John is said to have forged a book, Kitab, uh, which the boy took as authentic. So Kitab, I think, maybe should be taken here as simply a charter or something along those lines. When they were finally alone, the Frank is said to have bound the child and turned him over to the Templars in return for a sum of money. 
Um, and for the moment, I will leave aside the, the possible connotations of what, uh, was, what is implied by this act of forgery, um, which the Christian is accused of uh, undertaking. Uh, during his uh, captivity, the boy, who is now referred to as an age by the, by the Muslim chronicler, so a renegade of sorts, is said to have at first shown an interest in the Christian faith, for which he then repented. After several years, Shahin Shah is finally ransomed in return for many Christian captives and a large sum of money, as we've heard. For the Muslim chronicler, chronicler this entire sojourn in the Frankish captivity is equivalent to participating on a raid, Ghazwa, for which the young, from which the young warrior returns, quote, strong of heart. So in the end, he's neutralized or re, re, um, uh, admitted to uh, his original uh, political and uh, faithful environment. In several, in several ways, the two accounts complement each other. Both John and Shahin Shah are set to cross the lines for the promise of sovereignty and material wealth, but in the end, this sentiment of greed doesn't take away from their prowess. What is more, both accounts entertain a sense of cross edification. The Ayyubid prince becomes refined while in Frankish captivity, according to Abu Shama, or according to the French account, he is trained by John in Damascus, who himself is recognized for his acquaintance with Ayyubid military culture. Finally, both accounts portray the production of a knight, John or Shahin Shah whose oscillating motion constituted a defining part of their chivalrous aptitude. Both accounts, in other words, convey an urgent concern about the ease of crossing the lines and certain ambivalence with regard to its consequences, but at the same time, they describe the production of knights and the role in the changing regi uh, regimes to which they belong by embracing and breaching codes and conventions that uh, belong to both traditions. We are left with the, this, with the question of uh, how not only the change of regime, but also the change of faith functions within this so-called mercenary logic. Peculiarly, for many of the above-mentioned contributors to the scholarly discussion of frontier knights, conversion appears to lay beyond their interpretive stakes. For Fancy, for example, Hussein Fancy, for example, the fact that renegade knights sometimes, sometimes convert to the religion of their new rulers is almost irrelevant as he repeatedly stresses, as Anna mentioned, the enduring efforts, of, uh, efforts to celebrate or emphasize their difference or unique exclusi exclusiveness, as he calls it, sometimes decades after they will have uh, already been neutralized in their new faith. So for him, it doesn't matter if they become, if they become Christians because their, their, their appearance as, as Moors continues, continues to be emphasized. Uh, for Michael Lower, for example, to give another example, um, once or if knights uh, convert, so, for example, Islam, uh, then legally speaking, they're no longer considered mercenaries, and therefore, from a legal standpoint, it, it is no longer a question that needs occupy papal jurists. Or rather, it becomes a question for which jurists and the church have had a fairly stable set of legal tools to discuss and to act upon. I would suggest that the stories about John Gale and Shahin Shah on one side of the Mediterranean and Christopher and Bashir on the other side paint a different picture. A picture in which a range of conversionary activities is shown to be part of a spectrum of political gestures which knights were thought to employ in their oscillating motions through frontier life. Thank you very much. Anna, would you like to start to respond or to open the table for questions first? Yes? Maybe yes, yes. a little bit. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, okay. Yes, so, uh, Effie, would you like to start? Uh, so, 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 Luis, please. I'll just ask a brief question because in about eight minutes I'm going to Spain. And I was just. I'm going to Avila, which actually connects to my question. If the, I was wondering if you could talk more about the implicit taxonomy of penances associated with the rights involved to reconcile a relapsed convert. Uh, in this case, it seems, I mean, that Cristobal uh, de Chillon, I mean, got away easy. Just, I mean, he was whipped a little bit, and he was very chested, I mean, well, basically reconciling himself. I mean, many of the accounts we have of relapsed who are reconciled with the church have more elaborate penances. And the example that comes to mind, since I'm going to be in Avila tomorrow, 
is Teresa of Avila's paternal grandfather. I mean, he was, I mean, a Jewish convert who relapsed into Judaism, and when he's reconciled with the church in Toledo in 1476, at which time Teresa's father was five years old, he basically had to wear the San Benito and goes through all of the churches of Toledo in the course of seven weeks. So that was a more prolonged process, I mean, to reassert publicly his reconciliation with the church. So I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, in the range of materials you have examined, if you can de detect a particular, I mean, the equivalent to the Irish uh, uh, penitentiaries, where you have, I mean, very precise penances based on the gravity of the sin. But it seems that it's also a range of possibilities, even for the same particular practice of reconciliation. Central and periphery are the same, so that might be an answer, but also I think uh, there, there are many, many penances, many answers, and, and many cases. Uh, I think Casti at least seems to be very, very practical. And then I, here comes again, a Jewish convert relapsing is not the same as a Muslim convert relapsing. Yes, Sorry to say, but in all the cases, it's never the same. Never. And I'm still asking, as uh, Tom Berman was saying the first day, why on earth uh, is it so different? I mean, why are they always so, so harsh on Jewish converts? Uh, may, may I but, add something? Yeah. Perhaps uh, 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 an additional explanation. If you look at the pioneering study, Les Chrétiens de la Maïva, Lucille et Bartholomé Benassar, in which they portrayed the, uh, you know, the, the, the typos of the renegade, uh, that is the Christian who fled to Islam Muslim countries, and then they, they turned back again, they showed perfectly that uh, the Inquisition was, was very lenient uh, concerning this return. And, and the idea behind that was that, that this person, they could stay in Muslim countries. The, the very fact that they, they are returning to, to a Christian country, you know, is not a proof of sincerity, but at least is a way of gaining back again people who for sure will, will, will be lost. And, 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 but concerning the, um, the, the, the document you analyzed, through Harvey's very, very interesting, very illuminating uh, contribution of the Siete Partidas, we could even uh, think about a kind of, of, of periodization, if I say, concerning this issue. Since during the 15th century, perhaps, is still the idea of the Siete Partidas and others who is more or less codifying all these things, later on in the early modern period, Lucille San Bartolomé Banassar's patterns seems to, 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 to be yeah, a yeah, and, and the only reason why I brought it up, because in this particular case, this, um, which also highlights, I mean, the distinct treatment of Jews and Muslims in this case, they are both from within the same decade, and both relatively unknown figures who are being punished pre precisely for this. I mean, of course, I mean, Teresa's grandfather would become famous a posteriori, but not at the time. He, but, he wasn't born yet. But, but here I think what Uri was saying yes. about the military comes yes. into play. Yes. I mean, yes. Muslims are into the military somehow. They're preparing the campaign of Granada. They are fighting the yes. campaign. They have a use, an immediate use. And if you find people like this, you can use them in all kinds of ways. Uh, and then you do use them in all kinds of ways. So they prefer to be, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, yeah, very pragmatic. It's very, very pragmatic. Yeah, yeah. Very, very pragmatic. <laughs> and then also, there's there's another part which is what is the uh, royal civil uh, punishment and what is the religious punishment. And here you have the, the uh, uh, flagellation with mm -hmm. the religious punishment. That has to be there somehow because there has to be some consequence. Right. Yes. So that is one part. But then you have like the real punishment. The real punishment doesn't happen because mm -hmm. they are of some utility. So here we have to, I think, differentiate also what is. Uh, whereas in the case of a Jewish, I would say that the intellectual challenge to the church comes more evident, and, and, and the punishment is more strict in a way. I, I would say, but but. Yes. 
if you please. So um, I'd like to try to also think back on what Luis was saying, and, and thank you all for the fascinating presentations. And I think they're very well, goodbye. Uh, a very well tied together because um, there are a few thoughts that I have um, and I'd like to share. And one is um, I would like to ask Anna about what the benefits are for the patron. In other words, uh, you were showing that through this process of institutionalization, institutionalization, and this is something already that we know from the past that every almost every convert has a patron. But um, I, I was wondering about the difference. Um, from the difference that you said between a uh, patron in the central area of Toledo and a kind of rural or, or frontier uh, patron, what would what would be the different benefits for each kind of patron? What were the how how is his power enhanced through this kind of patronage over the um, manumission slash uh, um, conversion of, of these people? Um, as for the um, um, issue of, of the difference between Muslims and, and Jews, I'm, I'm convinced that, of course, you're right in the sense that being um, of, of uh, military usage, uh, and of course, I think even men mentally speaking, the fact that um, Christians do not see themselves as equal to Muslims, but they are equally empowered, while the Jews are not empowered. They're not part of the military etiquette, and as Uri showed very nicely, there is a lot of give and take, and, and, and uh, um, there is an incorporation of military knowledge on both sides. So this is a, a, a dialogue between equals as opposed to a dialogue with something else that may be on a different level, but, but it's not equal. Um, as for the punitive and, and, um, and penitential measures, what is fascinating to me is to see how Jews incorporate the same punitive and uh, penitential measures when, it, when they internalize these uh, things. We have uh, quite a few accounts of Jews uh, penalizing their own. Um, um, not necessarily uh, themselves, but, but, but um, uh, penalizing uh, uh, criminals um, using very similar methods. Again, bear shirting, flagellation, not, uh, nothing that comes from the in, inside, or not necessarily coming from inside the Jewish tradition, but from uh, customs adopted from the outside, prob probably because these are also public spectacles. And I, I like your comment about the fact that uh, what happens the, the, in the second document is something that is happening in a full public spectacle. And I, I, I'm also under the impression that part of the flagellation has to do with admonition, uh, admonishing the public. In other words, this is a public spectacle. This is theater. The, People are supposed to see that this person is not just walking away with a document and earning his freedom, but rather that he is going through a process of contrition, and that contrition is sincere. And even if this is all, you know, just uh, uh, acting out, uh, it has to be very, uh, you know, played out in a very vivid way. Um, my last comment is to Uri, um, and I couldn't stop thinking of a few issues. Um, think of uh, what has been going on in, in public culture in, in, over the past few years in series like Homeland, where people that are captives uh, are thought to be diverted, subverted, while in captivity. And of course, part of what is going on is, is um, maybe this inhibition. What is going on there when these people are across the line? Um, you know, Stalin wasn't completely wrong when he completely you know, psychotically, paranoidly uh, sus suspected every, each and every uh, uh, <laughs> Russian prisoner of war of being subverted by the Germans or by the Americans just by being in contact with them. Um, and the other issue that I was uh, reminded of when you were talking is, of course, the fact that the issue of having the ruler's entourage be markedly different from the other elements of the garrison is something that dates back a while. I mean, the ancient empires, the Roman Empire, it's very clear. Uh, this is also mimic, which is, in my mind, fascinating. Also, in Talmudic sources, we know that uh, Rabban Gabriel, the president, the, the Nasi of uh, the Sanhedrin here in Palestine, it has an entourage of German uh, bodyguards or, or 
male servants that surround him that are markedly different from the other members of his society that stand out and kind of demarcate his presence in the same form and manner that you were showing. So in that respect, it's also incorporating part of that into uh, a, a, a spectacle that's supposed to uh, make, make, make a certain, or deliver a certain message. And that brings me back to a comment I made yesterday at Ben-Gurion's grave, who is Ben-Gurion's bodyguard? Ben-Gurion's bodyguard is someone that he redeemed from the Lech. He, he, never not, redeemed. he never, he never no, redeemed. No, but he it, that's, of course, of course. But it's it's part of the show. The part of the show is I am taking my bodyguard from people who may seem to you as the most infamous of enemies, but they are my personal guard. There's there's a message being conveyed. I'm sorry, I, I wasn't there. Ah, okay. I'm sorry, I wasn't there yesterday okay. because Joshua called me. Yeah. Not my family. Ah, okay. And I know the story very well. Okay. I don't think anybody was redeemed. No, 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 no. I wasn't saying that he was reading, but, but from Ben Gurion's the perspective, from the appearances. I'm talking about the appearances that Ben Gurion incorporated someone into his personal entourage, and one of the most trustworthy people, as someone who was cr su supposedly crossing the lines, which of course he wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't, and that's that's part of the interesting. This is what uh, the Castilian king Henry IV uh, did with uh, his Muslim bodyguards, body, yes. and uh, the Castilian uh, opinion was very much uh, excited so, about. Right. It. So, um, I know. Would you like to to answer yeah, some yeah. of the questions here, and then we we'll continue to other yeah. remarks? Thank you. So the benefits for the patrons, uh, I think, not. We cannot follow in all cases, mm -hmm. but wherever we may have more details afterwards, they may be used in any different matters. It might be uh, the man wanted a translator or an interpreter. Uh, it might be uh, people who are in the household mm -hmm. and then uh, perform any kind of offices, whatever they are. They are. It might be just influences mm -hmm. at court or at the Granadan court. Mm -hmm. But influences in the Granadan court have to be read in the economical mm -hmm. area as well. So they might find, because what we see is that these people don't necessarily lose their links with their mm -hmm. uh, Muslim uh, family mm -hmm. in Granada in many cases. Uh, so these people are really uh, brokers. Go, go between. They, uh, they are go-betweens. And, and they may favor, uh, I don't know, maybe political influence, sometimes uh, But business. is this something that they would flash, in other words, no, in their they own, don't. they don't, no, no, they it don't. wouldn't that, that appear would on their epitaph, like the, I was the patron of the The backstage conference. politics okay. or backstage okay. influence, okay. And, and I, I, I mean influence, uh -huh. this word I think is a, a key word in all this, they might not know what they are putting them to use at the moment, but they might have influence afterwards. Mm -hmm. So and it's, and that it's, it's a long-term long policy. Yeah, it's a long-term policy. Uh -huh. And I think they are, they are quite successful in that. And it's the same what you were asking about, what is he traveling for? We don't know because we don't have more details, but it, it might be any of these reasons. Like, he might be in Toledo at this point, but he might go on company with his lord. He might be a spy. He might be working <coughs> in any kind of trade in between. He might do so so many things, that, but what is certain is that he will be traveling. That I'm, I'm, you, I'm almost sure, because then we have that, what he said, Chillon, is a very interesting place. Chillon is the center of mining of mercury, mm -hmm. and that is a Genoese monopoly in this time. So I don't think it's by uh, chance that he mentions the Genoese uh, when he rescues a child, and then we have Chijon, and then we have all this, you know, his easy way of coming back. Mm -hmm. There might be a lot more beyond that. Yeah, that's very interesting. But, so there are the Genoese business coming as well. And probably that's what <coughs> I would like to know also, why, what kind of business connections Benavides has in the area, because probably he's also linked to all of this, and then we will have a, a whole lot. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I can have a look. <laughs> yeah, that probably it all gets mixed. So it's a very interesting to have uh, this connection. And it might explain your feeling and my feeling that he will be probably manumitted in the end, 
and released because, uh, as I said, there are, there's nobody introducing him. And he's going to Alcalá la Real, which is a frontier town. He doesn't get back to Los Dolceles, which is where he originated, but goes to Alcalá, which is, in a way, a free town. And it's got fueros, it's got all kinds of liberties given to people who live there because they're not in the frontier. Mm -hmm. And the people who are witnessing are the folks, the, 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 the folks who live there. So probably he is going to be living there as a free man, I would say. It doesn't say, but one may assume. I mean, but the, the, the child was given by Jerry? No, I think he probably was um, captive and he was probably kept by oh. the Genoese because he was I a very see. important person. They didn't, they didn't I don't uh, think. capture him, but they were holding him. That's it. They, they why not, why not um, uh, collateral? Huh? Collateral in, in, a, um, in a barter deal? In other words, um, until you pay a big sum of money for whatever. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, no, no, not, not, not as a captive, but as collateral for a business deal. In other words, sure. in order to ensure that a business deal is, is carried out fully. It's not usual. Not usual. No, it's normally uh, because he's a child and maybe his father had connections or something. It's more likely, I would say, that they just keep him. Maybe the rescue, maybe they have business together yeah. if, if his father is from the area yeah. and they are in Chillon, the Genoese, I mean, they might have connections. Probably the father wanted to make sure that he doesn't get converted the other way. I, I'm not sure, but there, there might be the most likely, I think. As far as I remember, the Genoese were severely criticized within the, 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 the Christian domain because they are. They are they are pushing too forward the idea of their of economics and alliances with with Granada and in fact they were accused to to give a, a kind of oxygen to to, to Granada and, and to be in fact collaborators with, with Muslims. Yeah, but of course they were rich. I mean, criticizing has to happen. Yeah. And uh, the thing they don't say is that. As recent research has proved, there is there are as many monopolies held by the Catalans as by the Genoese. So it's not that the Genoese were being unfair. It's uh, you know it is business. It's business. Okay, we want, we want to. No, I'm in charge. So, it's, it's so, uh, so I'm going with this order and, and I know the order. Okay, so now we'll hear several remarks and we we'll start with Maurice here and then Nadia. I see, I see, but I'm going this way, so... Yeah. Uh, you said, perhaps, what I'm uh, going to say, you perhaps uh, said it, uh, and also it uh, was not sufficient attention. Um, in the first document, uh, Gomez Manrique, he, he was the corregidor of the city, which means that the police forces, in the, what we would call the police forces of the city, were under his responsibility. So, and the, the certificate is just after, as you mentioned, the creation of the Moreria of the of the Muslim quarter in the city. So, I could imagine, you know, today in Paris, for example, you could have uh, somebody looks as if uh, came, parents came from this. North Africa, the policeman will say, well, you, uh, show me your papers. So uh, you could have somebody around who looks in the uh, in, uh, street in Toledo that he's uh, around, perhaps with the house in the general city. The uh, policeman would say, uh, you, uh, show me who you are. And so Mr. Juan de Castilla, he has uh, the paper that uh, he is a Christian, and that so he can be, he can live with his house and not to go to the Moroni. So perhaps he cares to to the, the document has been given by the chief policeman Gomez Manrique. You you will stay in, uh, where you are, uh, and so uh, perhaps he the document is very elaborate. It shows that he. He thought about uh, Christianity, that uh, uh, he was uh, uh, catechized, etc., uh, etc. Et 
that uh, perhaps uh, he uh, what is behind this is that uh, this particular person converted in order not to go to Mongolia and uh, he had his document uh, proving that he was uh, he was sincere etc he was a positive character you know <laughs> and uh, so uh, and this is what uh, what he, what he, well, what there is here you know, uh, in, in, in the circumstances of the when the Muslims are sent to, to a distinct uh, Muslim quarter, some people try to evade to go there and though they convert and they have a certificate or a paper with them. But that's it, perhaps. Or the policeman leaves. Just a minute, just a minute, please. Nadia. Is there a hatred? Could they read? Sure. What what the universal uh, what's my question? Yes, I want to mainly to Uri's uh, observation about uh, the ruler's bodyguards. And um, I think it is a widespread Mediterranean phenomenon. Uh, in an earlier period, you see the Norman kings of Sicily employing Muslim bodyguards, sometimes allowing them to convert, sometimes not allowing them to convert. But the whole point is that they are not a feudal army. They are people who are uh, loyal to him personally. And uh, an interesting fact that I found just really <laughs> recently was uh, doing research on something else completely. Uh, there is a description of the king of Tunis employing Christian bodyguards, which are dressed as Christians, which uh, means that they are showing themselves as different, as loyal to the king, and they also enjoy all sorts of exceptional uh, privileges. So I think this should be taken really in a wider context and well maybe it should be explored further. Is there a You both I have this question of comment uh, and I speak to the whole and uh, all the participants. It follows a bit on, on what uh, Danny said a few days ago about motivations and how they are uh, presented. I'm trying to map out type motivations that we come across. And you can say that we have pull and push. The pull would be the way that what is attractive about the society to which somebody uh, converts. And there you see that the society that loses the person to convert usually would talk about the benefits. In other words, when the Jews would talk about how, why somebody converted, they would say he's getting social power, he's getting money, a position or something. Uh, of that nature, women. Uh, or women, how okay. bad <laughs> And uh, the gaming society, the society into which one converts, would usually uh, talk about the spiritual superiority. He saw the light and so on. So we have on the pull side here um, two different presentations, one from the losing society, one from the gaining society. But the common um, element here is that there is a pull. There is something that's attractive and, and so on. What we get from the story that came up uh, with Christophorus and from Eli Yassif's uh, students, and, and now from the text that Chaim uh, showed us about the reasons why people leave, is actually a different kind of motivation. That's a push motivation. In other words, this is they're suffering in their own society. They, are, they don't want to be students. You know, they're sick and tired of learning as, as any uh, students. Or this person, Christophorus, who was suffering at the hands of his uh, master or whatever. And the, the list that you mentioned here, a lot of it is just social injustice or that they desire to live. They don't want to live according to the customs anymore. In other words, when well, there the element is actually social criticism of different nature uh, or different caliber. And so I was wondering, this is sort of like a question, after mapping this out, can we say that a lot more attention goes to the pull element than the push? Because the push element is really much more painful to admit mm -hmm. is it, as, as a social criticism. I mean, this is just a general thought and, and an idea. And if somebody wants to comment on it, fine. Okay. Thomas, please. Yeah. Thank, thank you. My comments go in a little bit different direction again because of my my, my you know, intellectual historians' way of 
thinking about things. But what strikes me about your presentation, Hannah, and these documents is that we see something that's always been very interesting to me, and that is this um, expansion of the number of words available in Western languages for Muslim, particularly in the late Middle Ages. And uh, in the documents collectively, we see almost all of them. We see Hagarin, we see the Latin Maurus, we see Saraceni, we see Moro, um, we see the term uh, Perfidia, Maumatana. Um, we have this huge range, whereas in the kind of official theological discourse, there's still only one word. It's still Saracenus, and the religion is Saracenismus. Um, and it's always intrigued me why we have this, uh, this dividing up of terminology. And I thought it was particularly surprising that in the papal document, um, we have Maori and uh, Agarini, which Agarini is really a word you much more often in the early Middle Ages. Uh, before, say, 1100, and Maori is much later and doesn't show up very much in Latin, it seems to me, regarding uh, Muslims states conceived of as Muslim. And I began to wonder while I was sitting here whether one of the things that's going on is that having more words gives uh, certain advantages. There's a certain utility in having more words. And just in the two documents that you have here, in the first, it seems like it's you, you, the use of perfidia maumatana, which is about as harsh as you can get, kind of makes sense uh, in that context of conversion. Whereas the use of moro in the second, it, it sort of sounds, it's very prosaic the, the, to me, the way the Spanish works here. Um, Siendo como fue uh, moro de naturaleza. Well, he was born that way. I mean, what, do we, what can we do about that? And being a captive, fue tornado cristiano. And then uh, being uh, a que estando in las la dicha ciudad tornado moro, these things happen. Yeah. You know, you you you're a captive and you go someplace and and and, and you know you convert. That's what happens. And and uh, so, I mean, do, do you have a sense in, in these documents otherwise that there's a these are rhetorical choices uh, that are being made between all of these various words that you can use, or is that just a, a, an artifact of these particular documents. Then, two short questions. When did these documents have Jews and or former Jews and former Muslims appear together? Like, do they ever marry with each other? Or are they totally separate communities that that are dealt with totally separately and you never see them interact? And the other question was, I'm intrigued by the people who change sides in the war, whether or not it's the religion is the only variable. I mean, one would think that there might be some national element or racial or ethnic element that they wouldn't want to, to be a guard for the king is one thing, but to be the, the, in battle, I mean, is it like changing, being traded from one sports team to another, and you suddenly are the enemy of the person you used to be a, a member of? It seems to be a little less drastic than starting to kill those same people that you were fighting with the day before. And so is, is religion the only or the, the, the major or exclusive uh, variable. Yes, please. My question is similar to uh, the last, but I'd like to put a different slant on it. I'd like it, in, perhaps in light of the question previously, it seems to me that the religious language is being used in a very pragmatic way to justify a change of sign that was taken for various reasons, even with all the talk about, you know, I've seen the light, etc., etc. And uh, I'd like your take on that. Any more? Would you like to add something? Just, just to point that uh, these terms, there's a translation between religious and social, ethnic uh, <laughs> use of it. It's very interesting. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, yeah, I, Wolf I, lives. I think my comment is very obvious, but I'd like to make it explicit. I think it's something we all know, but we should bring into the conversation, which is. Our documents, yes, there are many, many words for more Muslim. Um, they only use one word for Christian. And when you're talking about conversion or you're talking about religious theological di documents discussing conversion um, or intermarriage or something, you have either Jew or Muslim or Christian. But once you enter Christian society, it doesn't mean anything 
to just be a Christian. You're never just a Christian. You're a Christian something. You're a Christian draper, or you're a Christian member of a family, or you're a Christian knight, or not. Um, and I think this speaks to uh, Nisha Josh raised this morning. I mean, what about the people who disappear? I, you, Josh, you said something or other like they wanted you to become a Christian, but they didn't really let you just be a Christian. And that's because you can't just be a Christian in medieval England. So those converts who managed to tap into a network or enter a kinship group or gain a status in a job, work for a ruler, they might disappear eventually because there are something. And it also has to do with the documentation. I mean, maybe you need a pass like this if you have nowhere else to go. You need to go to the king because it's the king who has overall, you know, overall control or the royal authorities or the urban authorities who have overall control over, you know, I'm a Christian so you can't hurt me. But, you know, maybe if you manage to join a guild or you manage to join a confraternity or you manage to marry into a family, you get documentation from them and they don't have to say, so they converted and we know they're a Christian. Well, they just have to say, right. Anymore. You don't need documentation anymore. The documentation doesn't reveal your convert status. This person is a member of our confraternity and so don't mess with them or something like that. I would like to add only one short remark. You mentioned the. Uh, uh, edict of separation or get ghettoization is the historical context of these, uh, these uh, documents. But maybe the establishment of the Spanish Inquisition two years before or a year before is also part of this context of seeking an, a document of identification for the religious uh, identity. Okay. No, because they don't have uh, jurisdiction yes. over Muslim. Yes, yes. 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 Very short. Only, uh, very, very short. Uh, perhaps some of you know uh, knows a Barbara Fuchs book, Maurofilia, according to which uh, a late medieval and, and early modern Spain became more and more identified with Moorish uh, style life. And, uh, and this is very interesting, taking it to, into account what, what you showed, in the sense that these borderline cases turned to be, uh, especially from Charles V on, uh, turned to be a kind of, uh, of uh, identification of a, a Spain specificity. And if it is so, then the, the, phen the phenomenon you are showing here is even much more complex. Which again may be true for Charles I. But this is she tried to show that this began during during the second half of the 15th century to adopt a Moorish Moorish uh, custom. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, this is what she said. But sh little by little, from the periphery to the to the epicenter. I haven't read the book, ah. so I can't say. I will look for it. Yes. But my problem with this is that Charles the First is a foreign. So again, uh, the transformations, the mental transformations in this time are one world and what we have 15th and before. And it's very, I, I, I would. Yes. Yeah. But so yeah. well, very quickly to the rest. Uh, the problem with uh, going to what Maurice was saying, the problem I find with uh, that interpretation of, of the Moorish court, well, I have two problems with the uh, Moreria problem. Um, first of all, is there are so many people from Toledo mentioned in the in the record that even if he doesn't want to get into the Moreria, then he has to live as a Christian. Because he has to be? A Christian, really. Because there are too many people watching. So I would say, even if, if the original reason is not to get into the Moreria, in the end, he has to be a proper convert because it's too common, I would say. The second problem I have there is uh, 
the record is found in the archive of Murcia. Why is it in Why Murcia? So? so he probably traveled. Probably. I'm not sure. But at some point, he must have traveled, I suppose. Left the paper for Murcia. Left the paper or something. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Then, um, what else? Hmm. Yeah, like the expansion of the words for Muslims. The thing is, it, there are so many that's true, but the fact that we find more all around has to do with the, the introduction of vernacular language. So we, we have here two different fields. I mean, uh, religious discourse keeps the Latin, so Saracenus will always be there, whereas all the rest of the records, both uh, documents and legal texts and so on, once they start to be written in Castilla, we have model all around. So here we have again a very practical use of the word. And if you have, like, we, it is very practical and at the same time it needs to be qualified. And here comes, I think, the second part. They use different words for different legal situations and they are very clear about it and they know very well which words go with what. Like for us historians, it's not so clear, I think. But for them, every time, I, 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 they are very consistent. And as, as I go through more and more things, they keep being very consistent. Uh, not so much the historiography about it, mm -hmm. but they are very consistent. Mm -hmm. So if you find Moro, or if you find Moro Bethino, the, Mor, the Moor who is a neighbor, or if you find Saracen or Agarin or whatever you find, they know very well why they are using it. It might not be clear to us, but it is very clear to them, I would say. And then we have this um, interaction between Jewish converts and Muslim converts. They have interaction, but they don't intermarry. As far as I've seen, uh, one might find something new, but for the moment. Um, they intermarry within their own group, or they are uh, married, and this is very consistent as well in the Muslim group, they are found nice Christian women to marry with. So they can carry, the women can carry the old Christian status into the family. Mm. So in the high strata society, you would find the king or the archbishop or whoever finding a nice woman of old Christian origin who will be a good mother for their children. Muslims are not Jews? Or? Muslims. I'm not sure about Jews. I don't, I don't use so much um, Jewish convert uh, records. But I think, I mean, they are related to many important families anyway. So yeah. probably it holds true as well. Um, and the changing fields, I think, Religion is not the motive most of the time. Uh, there are others, especially on the frontier. You can see it very clear. And um, but turning around and shooting at the, at the the people you were used to. They don't shoot. They organize the peace conferences. Uh. <laughs> okay, uh, some of them at least. I mean, but let's say. I mean. And here I want to make a big difference between mercenaries and bodyguards, which is not always made in books. Uh, mercenaries are always fighting people from another religion. They, don't, they are not used normally to fight their own co-religionaries. There's always this feeling of treason, so they will not be used. And if they are like bodyguards, like the ones my kings have, uh, they are used to arrange conferences very useful. I mean, they get their uh, family members or, you know, the next tribe or whoever it is into their houses. They pay them proper uh, host attention in their own ways. Uh, they entertain them they, while the king is having, um, you know, uh, the, the proper conversations for whatever reason. And then they go back to Granada very happy because they've seen their cousin and they, you know, they've been entertained properly in the, in the usual ways. You can see it. So, so anyway, I think uh, religious boundaries are so hard to define. That would be my 
Uh, so sometimes it's personal conviction, sometimes it's just, there are some of them who are in the wrong side, uh, really in the wrong side. I mean, when, when the king of Granada kills the Abed, Abed Saraj family, uh, many of that, the members of that family seek refuge in Castile. Some convert, some don't, but, but they have to run away. So, so what's the reason for conversion? Well, first they run away, <coughs> then I will think about it. Some of them convert, fine, but, well, who knows? Maybe those were persuaded by religious reasons, by reasons of convenience, God knows. And so we And that's it. Yeah, that's it. Very Yeah, I think that's all for me. Marlon. Thank you very much. Thank you.